Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Cauchy's theorem. Okay, so what we're now going to do is consider a group action by the cyclic group on P elements, okay, which I'll denote CP here, on this set capital S, which consists of all of these P tuples of elements of the group capital G, which obey this criterion. Okay, right, so firstly let me just remind you of the cyclic group on P elements because a good understanding here is going to be incredibly important. So remember the cyclic group on P elements, we think of the elements of this group as representing the cyclic permutations of a set of P elements. Okay, and we can denote them uh, by 0, 1, 2, all the way up to P minus 1, where this number tells you how many times, uh, well, how by how much each of these elements denotes the uh, moving along of the elements of the set, okay, if you get my meaning. So remember, the elements of this group are denoting these cyclic permutations of some set of p elements. So this one would denote you moving everything along by nothing, this one would denote you moving everything along by 1, let's say moving everything to the right by 1, okay? This would denote you moving everything along by 2, etc., all the way down to this one, denoting you moving everything along by p minus 1. Okay, and then if you move everything along by p, that's the same as moving everything along by nothing. Okay, so there's the notation that I'm going to use for the cyclic group on p elements. Okay, so what we're now going to consider is a group action by this group on this set capital S. Okay, so what we'll do then is produce a group action composition table, and I'm just making sure this is in view, like so, and we'll call the group action dot as normal, and what we'll do is we'll give every element of the set, so every great big uh, p-tuple of elements of the group, uh, will be given a column in this composition table here, so I'll put all of S up here, and I'll just add a bit of colour on this to make it look less intimidating, so we'll colour the table in, in green here, and we're putting all of the elements of the set up here, okay, that's fine, and then of course we'll put all of the elements of our group that's acting on the set down here, so we'll have all the elements of the uh, cyclic group here, 0, 1, 2, all the way down to the bottom here, P minus 1, and they will all now act on each of the p-tuples of elements of the group that is in this set, capital S. Now, how are they going to act? Well, of course, they're just going to cycle the entries in this cyclic way that we've discussed. We've discussed that when you cycle the entries in a p-tuple that's in this set, capital S, the thing that you end up with is always still going to be in the set, capital S. It's always still going to obey the important criterion. Okay, so zero here will cycle everything by nothing, it will leave it exactly the same, so it will take every single uh, p-tuple onto themselves. Okay, one will cycle everything, let's say, to the right by one. Okay, so it would take this entry here to this entry here. Two would cycle everything along to the right by two. Okay, so it would take this one here to this one here and etc. all the way down to p minus 1, which would cycle everything along uh, to the right by p minus 1. Okay, so we know that this is indeed looking like it could be a group action. Okay, it is going to take elements of the set and map them onto other elements of the set. Okay, we do just need to talk through why it will obey the two axioms of a group action. So remember, the two axioms of a group action are, number one, that it must be compatible with composition in the group. Okay, so for if, if you take two elements of the group, for all G1 and G2 that you take from the group, which is this case is the cyclic group on P elements, and for all the elements of the set that you take, so we'll say little s, which is an element of the set capital S, it must be the case that if you take g1 dot g2 dot s, i.e. you firstly act g2 on s and then act g1 on s, that this is equal to g1 composed with g2 dot s. Well, I hope that that is... Um, fairly obvious. I hope that intuitively you understand why that is true. To actually write down a proof of that, I would just have to create a little bit more notation, which is why I don't really want to have to do it. But I hope that you intuitively understand why 
indeed this the composition of the elements in this group is going to be compatible with the um, way that I've defined this group action, because how have I defined this group action? I've let each one of these represent the permutation of the entries in the uh, p-tuple that it would represent if we were thinking of these as actually being permutations. So truly, this is going to be completely compatible with this. Of course, composition of two of these, as far as the group action concerned is concerned, is going to be compatible with the composition over here. So I hope that intuitively you understand that the fact that I have defined this using uh, bearing in mind, rather, the cycle permutations that each of these represent on p elements means that indeed this group action is going to be compatible with the composition in the group. Okay, in addition then, uh, axiom number two is that the uh, identity element of our group must act on all elements of the set to give that element of the set back, and we've already discussed that that's going to be true. So for all little s, which is an element of the set capital S, O, the identity acting on S, must give S, and we know that that's going to be true because it's not going to uh, cycle the uh, entries at all, it's just going to move everything along by nothing, which of course doesn't change where the entries are and you stay with the same element of the set. Okay, so indeed this is a group action, we have a nice group action by this cyclic group on P elements uh, on uh, the set capital S of these P tuples which satisfy this important property. Okay, now here comes the argument, because at the moment everything's just been set up really. Here comes the argument that's going to prove Cauchy's theorem. Okay, so what we're now going to do is consider partitioning up our set capital S into the orbits of this group action. Okay, once you've defined a group action, one of the very nice things that you can do with a group action, indeed one of the main reasons that we create group actions, is to partition the set up into orbits. It's one of the incredible ways that we can use group theory to understand sets. Okay, so what we will do is, drawing a little picture here, we will partition our set up into the orbits of this group action, and remember, of course, that the orbit of an element, let's say we've got some element S here, the orbit of that will be all of the elements in the set that it can be mapped onto by elements of the group. So you'll go through all of the elements of the group here, you'll ask where is S sent to, i.e. you'll look at all of these cycle uh, permutations of the um, entries in the p-tuple, and you'll have a look at where all of the entries could go to, okay, all of the different p-tuples that you could end up with, you'd stick those all into a set, and that would be the orbit of S here, okay, in red here. And then what you'd end up doing is doing this all over the set, so you'd produce orbits for all the elements like so, and you'd produce a nice partition of the set like so. And what we can say instantly is that the order of the set, which we already have an answer for, it is n to the power of p minus 1, it's going to be the sum of the orders of all of the orbits, so all of the orbits here, where you let s vary over all representatives for all the orbits, so you'll want a representative from every single orbit, okay, um, and you'll sum up the orders of all of the orbits, and that will give you the order of the entire set, capital S. Okay, now, where to next? Well, of course, the next thing, I mean, this is a classical uh, way of arguing things, the next thing to go to is the orbit stabilizer theorem. We know that uh, we can gain information, gain understanding of the size of an orbit through the orbit stabilizer theorem. The orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that the order of the group that is acting on the set, okay, which in this case is P, because we've chosen the cyclic group on P elements, which has P elements itself, okay, uh, is equal to the order of an orbit times the order of the s orbit order rather of the stabilizer of that element. So the order of the orbit of S times the order of the stabilizer of S, which remember is the subgroup of the group which is acting on the set, which fixes that element S, must equal this prime p, which is the order of the entire group that is acting on the set capital S. Okay. Now what does that tell us? This is a prime. So how many options are there for the size of an orbit? Not many is the answer. It can either be 1, in which case the stabilizer would equal p, 
i.e. all elements of the group would stabilize that element, i.e. Uh, it's very boring. It can only, uh, whenever any element of the group acts on it, it remains the same, hence it's in an orbit by itself or the size of the orbit can equal p, in which case all of those different cycles of it, i.e. where you've moved everything along by a different amount, are all going to be different. Again, they're all in an orbit together, and in that case the stabilizer will equal 1, and the only element that fixes it will be uh, the identity here. Okay, so there are only those two options, because of course this is a prime number. So those are the only two options. You cannot have two other natural numbers here multiplying together to give that, um, because then that that would be a composite. You'd have you know you'd have composite uh, here, okay, which would contradict it being a prime number. Okay, right. So the order of this orbit of S can only be equal to one or p. Now we understand those elements in the sets, those p tuples of elements of the group, uh, which would have order of its orbit equal to p, okay, that's where when you cycle the entries around you always end up with a new uh, a new element of the set capital S. Let's think about those ones that would be in order, orbits of size 1, okay, well that means that whenever you cycle the entries around it doesn't change the p-tuple, the p-tuple stays the same. That would be something that looks like this, where you've got all the same elements in every single entry, and we're actually incredibly interested in these elements of the set capital S. Why are we interested in these elements of the set S, where the entry is the same in each of these P sockets? Well, because what was the condition that it has to obey? The condition was that A to the power of P is equal to the identity. So suddenly this is all starting to connect up. These very special elements of the set capital S are going to be the solution to Cauchy's theorem. They're going to be the elements of the group which have order, this prime P, uh, and hence if we can prove these exist, i.e. that they're in the set capital S, then we're done. We have proven that there are elements in this group of order, this prime. Okay, now I can be sure that there will equal one of these instantly, and the reason is if you look at the one where you put the identity in every single socket, so this is going to be an element of S where you've put the identity in every single one of these P sockets, so this is an element of S. Okay, and of course this satisfies that condition where you take the identity times the identity all the way down to the identity here, uh, you will in fact get the identity, it's very boring, but you will get the identity, so that's certainly going to be an element of S. Okay, and this is going to be in an orbit of size 1, because no matter which element of the group you use to act on this, you can move everything along by however much you like, it's not actually going to change, because you're just moving the identity along, you, well, yeah, it, it's not going to change, because everything's the same in all of the entries, so it doesn't change by moving everything along by a cycle decom uh, sorry, not a cycle decomposition, a cycle permutation. Okay, so indeed this will be in an orbit of size 1. Our question, the question of proving Cauchy's theorem, comes down to are there other elements of this form where you have the same element of the group in all P sockets here, but where this element of the group is not equal to the identity, so we don't want A to equal the identity, because if there is other elements of the set of this form, then we're in business. So we need to ask, are there going to be other orbits of size 1? Because th if this was in the set capital S, it would be in an orbit of size 1. Now why can I be sure that there are other orbits of size 1, apart from the orbit that contains this orange one here? Well, it comes from this statement here. I know that the order of the entire set is a multiple of p. Remember, that was the thing that we did up here. It is going to be a multiple of p because n was a multiple of p. Okay, M was the order of the group, remember. So when I add all of these things up, I must get a multiple of P. Now, most of the orbits are going to be of size P. The orbits, remember, can only be size P or size 1. Most of the orbits are going to be size P because uh, they have these sensible P tuples where you don't have the same element in all of the P sockets. Okay, and those will all have orbits of size P. So you'll end up adding loads of orbits of size p together, and of course when you add loads of p's together, you will get a multiple of p. However, we know that one orbit 
at least is size 1. Okay, why does that allow me to argue that there must be other orbits of size 1, i.e. other elements of the group, which when you put them in all p sockets here, actually obey this criterion that a to the power of p is equal to the identity? Well, because if there was just one, if this was the only element of this form that had an orbit of size 1, then it would ruin this equation, because I'd be adding loads of orbits of size p together, and then right at the end I'd add one orbit of size 1 onto it. And when you take a great big multiple of p and add 1 to it, you do not get a multiple of p back again. Okay, A great big multiple of p plus 1 is not a multiple of p, but that would contradict this being a multiple of p. The order of the set has to be a multiple of p. So that means that you have to have at least p minus 1 other orbits of size p, so that those one, sorry, p minus 1 orbits, other orbits of size 1, so that those 1s can overall add up together to give p. Okay, so that then proves that there must be other orbits of size 1 here, i.e. there must be other p tuples where all of the entries are the same element of the group. That element of the group is no longer going to be the identity, okay, so we have found some other element of the group that can exist in a p-tuple that's in the set S, and therefore it must be the case that if I take A and compose it with itself p times, it equals the identity. So hence we have proven the existence of other elements of the group besides the identity, which if you raise them to the power of p, will equal the identity. So we've proven Cauchy's theorem. If you have a group of order a multiple of p, then there will exist elements in that group of order p, and therefore you can generate the cyclic subgroup generated by those elements, and you've now found a cyclic subgroup of your uh, group of order, that prime which divides the order of the group. Okay, so this is a very handy theorem in many proofs in group theory.